But when, it, when it's a work of art like that, the artist is essentially saying, well, you're supposed to have your own experience. Like there is, because ultimately the real, the real, um, dare I say, authentic and dare more I say, kind of sacred, like core essence, like the, the cream, the true cream filling of like what art or whatever, or spirituality like is like that. People making contact with that is very, very much a threat to this system. Because, I mean, and again, I think, you know, that's why I think like these, these native ceremonies are so powerful. Because once you make contact with that, you're, you can never look at the world in quite the same way again, because it's just, that dissonance is too potent. It's like, no, this is disrespectful to the real experience that I had with that there, that moment in time. And that's, that is the experience, that is the artistic experience. You never look at the world the same way again. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The world right. hasn't changed. The world doesn't change. I mean, well, change is constant, but the world hasn't changed. Your perspective has changed. The way you view it has changed. You'll never look at it with the same eyes again. And that's ultimately what I would argue that art is about. Giving somebody the ability to have that experience where they go, wow, I'm never going to look at the world the same way again. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the inaugural episode of the Make Art Not Friends podcast. My name is Andy. My co-host will be Boris. We thank you for joining us as we dive into all things art. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, I thought if we wanted to get into it, just kind of talk about, you know, kind of what we hope to achieve, what we kind of hope to talk about, what we, uh, if we want to get into some like definitions you know, working definitions of art or different aspects related to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go wherever we go, I guess. Solid. Yeah. That's, that's kind of was a, what I was expecting. Um, yeah. I was just thinking before, just a few minutes ago, even before I got on, I was thinking of that statement you made where you said, you know, the paint incidentally, I, I did some painting with a friend of mine Um some like really like out there visionary painting of a kind I don't know if I've ever really done before. And I don't think either one of us would have done it on our own. It was like really, um, I don't know, kind of like that, that archetypal, like dark, like oblivion of painting where it's like mm -hmm. the artist is like, you know, and like the world is kind of going crazy and the artist is like, ah, you know, like, going in and so I don't know I, I I can't say I ever had that archetypal experience before certainly not painting with another person it was like a whole thing um, um, but yeah basically afterwards we were talking about it and um, and, and then she <laughs> she um, commented on we have this other piece of art hanging in that same building well okay let me put it we have this other piece of art hanging in that same building and it's like a frame, you know, to, and, and she and I are both artists. So like this is secondary to like the criticism of it on, on technical grounds. She was mm -hmm. saying, you know, look at this. Like it's not even really a painting. It's just like sort of like some weird watercolor looking things on, on a canvas. And then over the top of it is like this ink drawing. And she was like, that's so, that's so cheap. Like you can rescue anything by stamping ink on it and I was like I really like ink but I'm inclined to agree with you and then but then the actual basically I'll tell you what it is so it's like a mandala I wish I, I guess I, I wish I had it handy but I, can, I think I can describe it pretty well it's a mandala drawn in ink with like this it, it, there's like three rings there's an inner ring a middle ring and an outer ring and it's like this and so this 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 building is a yoga retreat mm -hmm. center studio mm -hmm. so like that's kind of the aesthetic 
Sure. Um, and, the, and, and, and it's like, this is what sent me, this painting really is what sent me down this whole like avenue of thought, if you will, is that it's got all the different, and like, you know, I, this is my disclaimer is I obviously don't judge anyone, whatever your lifestyle is, as long as you're not hurting anyone, like that's awesome, whatever. You know what I mean? I'm not going to prescribe anything to anyone. Yes. But just as a, you know, I feel like certain things belong in a painting and other things belong at like the DNC talking points. So it's got like all the different like, like gender symbols and polyamory, like little arrangements, like around the middle. And then it's got like all of the different skin tones around the very outside. And it's like this like Lotus mandala. And in the middle is this extremely cheesy, bright red heart just right in the middle, just this juicy, like, you know, like not like an anatomically correct heart, which I'm right, quite right. fond of and I use a lot in my art. I think that's beautiful, but like just a heart. And it's just, and she was just commenting on it. And she was like, cause after we had done this whole painting that we did, which was like a vibe, like that painting, we de that painting could definitely sell for, not that that is what gives art, you know, it's, you know, accolades or whatever, but you know, you just, it was like, Anyway, so she was she was just standing in front of it. She was like, you can't tell me that if someone stands in front of this painting and then they stand in front of our painting, that they would ever be confused, like that they would, you know, that there would be any confusion about like which one is art. And I was like, I agree with you. But unfortunately, I feel like a lot of less informed people would just not because, and so this is what made me want to, you know, bring this up is the pandering the pandering to the lower level of consciousness and the lower, and this is another thing because you had that, the, the dictionary of symbols, people tend to like or approve of art that does not exceed their existing vocabulary of symbols. Because it's just like, you know, with science, people like things that make them feel comfortable and capable, or at the very least, they like just being told they don't like that open endedness where it's like, what is this, you know? And then the, w w when it, when it's a work of art like that, the artist is essentially saying, well, you're supposed to have your own experience. Like there is no, you know, I'm not, it, it's not. So I just wanted to illustrate, you know, put that out there as an example, because I feel like so much of art now, you know, I was on um, Instagram, I was on social media for a long time. Uh, putting my my visual art out there, and I I loved it. I loved being able to share that. People really liked it. People responded to it well. But I gradually sort of just noticed this like encroaching, kind of corporatized, weird, new age, like vice grip, and everything gradually just became like ohm and chakras. And again, not that there's anything wrong with that, but the feel of it is just like people's actual style you know it's it's i just wanted to bring up this topic because i think it's like a really fruitful one um yeah i think it's a really important topic i think the kind of big thing the the that calls to mind for me in addition to talking about the people not being able to uh, appreciate something that's that that's mm -hmm. outside of the realm of their symbol language and mm -hmm. you know that's all kind of a whole nother topic about there are being four fundamental types of, of language, and one of them is symbols. Um, so the, that all aside, the you know when it comes down to everything being like a chakra or some you know kind of standard symbol or the you know the chakras or the the om or what have you, for me, it ceases because when something becomes ubiquitous, it ceases to have an individualized interactive meaning and it's usually kind of meant to have some sort of vague space that it holds that people put their own thoughts, beliefs, whatever into, as opposed to, or, you know, the, the, the what, but not their thoughts, but, but they're what they think that everybody else thinks is the way to think about that thing. Right. So they're not really thinking, it just kind of holds some sort of spot mental placeholder that, that is not investigated at all. And I think that's what it then comes down to is people for the most part, don't want to take the responsibility of 
critical thought. Mm -hmm. Don't want to take the time or the the energy to think about the things that they see. Um, And in doing so, kind of just outsource that to whatever they believe the public kind of collective zeitgeist about that concept happens to be. And they they think kind of along terms that they can't really then define. Um, And one of those, you know, things comes back to art. People, you know, I've been asking people, we've been talking about this over the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, just what is art? What do you, how do you define art? Nobody gives me a coherent definition, really. Right. I mean, people say like, oh, it's paintings. It's okay. Well, that's an example of an art medium. Yes. But um, what about a thing makes it art or not art? You know, most people say, well, it's all art. Or I've heard several people say it's all art, but some of it's good art and some of it's bad art. And I think what you're describing, you know, is when something becomes so ubiquitous and still people still at one point it might have been useful as an artistic symbol or might have uh, be usable in some other context or what have you. But it's gotten to the point where it's what I call like TJ Maxx art. Exactly. And it's just the kind of thing where it's just supposed to sit on a wall and be a part of the landscape. And that's not really art. Well, it's it, right. And it becomes, I think this is a really crucial point, you know, and again, just being a visual artist, this is something that, you know, for me, it's like, I don't know if I were a doctor and I saw someone like dropping motor oil inside a patient, I just like recoil when I see it, which is this sort of standardization of art um, to like, as though it is just another uh, accoutrement, like TJ Maxx, the perfect example, it's just like another like white lady object that serves Mm -hmm. a function, like a stand mixer or a candle holder. And it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what the design is. It doesn't matter what's going on compositionally, if it's a painting or a car, you know, it's like, then there's, there's an epidemic of that kind of stuff, you know, of just like, live your best life. Mm-hmm. I love that journey for you. You know, and it's like these. And so I think in that sense, and this is just goes syncs up really well with this general trend in society of like the confounding of, of symbol language in general, Mm -hmm. um, which is that marketing, which is sort of like the lowest form of art in a way, because it's not really, it's, you know, rather than it's, it's the least open-ended. It's literally like where art meets hypnosis, which no disrespect to hypnosis, but you know, there's, you know, there's vastly different things. And so, and, and I feel like that's where, you know, it, it exists just to serve a purpose. And it's just like, um, you know, people, pe- that, and, and that's, I think, what makes people so allergic to real art or good art is that, you know, it's like uh, a bug that your immune system has no experience with. And you're like, oh my God, what is, you know, I'm not comfortable with this feeling, mm-hmm. you know, because like people have really been, especially now, especially the younger generation, have really been brought up on, you know, this like sort of pre digested, you know, penguin vomit form of art where it's like, you know, there's no like, you know, and this sort of reconnects to that other conversation I was having with you, you know, where like that doodle and like, I'm not, I'm not trying to disrespect any individual artists. I'm just talking about trends. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it, you know, and a similar thing is happening in, in music, you know, where it's like, it's becoming increasingly diff- difficult for artists who do more old school stuff that requires a lot more like effort and technical ability and, like a feel for like the emotional content of the art, like people not, they're really moving away from that. It's more like the, you know, like that's not what's in right now for for Mm -hmm. better or for worse, in my mind for worse, you know, it is what it is, but um, you know, there's just, and so that's just a trend quite frankly that like, I don't know what to do about that as somebody who likes to make art, the type of stuff that I want to make, finding more and more that, you know, on a large scale, people just are not really consuming that kind of stuff anymore. And so it's just kind of like a quandary. And I even was talking to one of my roommates about it because she does like a fabric and she makes clothes and stuff. And she cool. was like, I went to the market and, you know, I just see people selling all this like cheap crap. And I was like, yeah, I know. You know, like there was this one, oh my God, <laughs> there was this one lady 
She was like, I painted all these refrigerator magnets by hand. We looked at them. They were like, they were every single awful thing that we're talking about right now, just crammed into one. Like it was like ohm and just gaudy acrylic paint and like glitter swirled in. And it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't even like small. It was like this big. And she was selling them for 15 bucks. And we were just like, she was like, aren't they great? And we were like, <laughs> just like couldn't even like elicit a noise. We were like, oh God. And then later I was like, damn. And she was like, what the fuck? And I was like, I told you just the only way to survive in this world is just to make really, really, really nice shit for really, really, really rich people. Because which, that's, which you is, know. Which is, which has a long history in right. art history in the, in art of the past, even up to this day. So that's certainly, I mean, that's a whole topic of the history of the patronage of the arts, but right. sometimes questionable folks. Right. Um, and does that compromise the integrity of the artist and that whole, you know, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a, that's an entire, uh, Worms, yeah. that's an entire hour on, on itself easily. Um, but I don't know. I think that's all I had to say. I kind of interrupted you. I think. <laughs> No, no, not at all. I, I took a breath. That's as good a signal as any. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just, no, that's a good point. And I feel like um, I just, that's something I want to explore because I want to make, you know, I want to make art. I'd love to make money off of my art. That's like my fucking dream. But, you know, it's tough because it's not, it's not like other things. Although, you know, of course, there's there's an intersection to be spoken of, right? Like, I there are things that have utility that can still be objet art. Like, I'm very interested in, like, woodworking and, like, you know, if I could... I guess this is kind of, like, maybe two-thirds up the way to, like, more wealthy consumers. But, you know, if I could, like, do the woodworking thing and, like, make, like, a nice wooden box and I could, like, carve it or, like, oil paint it, like, that would be... Mm -hmm amazing i would love to produce something like that because it's the best of both worlds mm -hmm. but you know it's not like r d where you're like let me test this material and see like you know if when they put on the the the, the fabric it'll tear you know like you, it, it's not it's just sort of you mm -hmm. put it out there and then people either like it or they don't and um and and in that sense i feel like the people that you know obviously the the medici sort of um artisans you know they had it really good because it's like hey i'm gonna put you up in my you know manner essentially until i'm done with you and you're just gonna you know paint portraits of nobility or whatever my family but, yeah yeah just like you know make us look good and you know then maybe we'll have you do some like religious scenes to like you know keep mm -hmm. up appearances and you know feel free to encode lots of occult sh you know it's just sort of like carte blanche Whereas now, you know, now we don't have that sort of trickling down of, of resources. And unfortunately, I feel like the, the artists that become really, really, really big, their art is usually used to launder money. So that's another, that's you true. know what I mean? Like the, so yeah, it's a, quite frankly, it's a world that I'm, I feel like when I was a kid and I was really like young and idealistic, I was like, I love to draw, you know, <laughs> it's just, I didn't see these dimensions of it you know i also didn't i hadn't seen idiocracy yet at that age i don't think it had been made yet so i couldn't have fathomed the world right that, that i you know that we would be inheriting post haste and uh yeah and in that world it is i yeah that's why i think this podcast is really really necessary like what the fuck what is art you know what are we doing here like is there still a place for it you know it's very um very relevant yeah and i think to your point about the modern art world as it's, I don't know, the art industry really. Right. Um, the, so you're saying like the, the, the world of art today, as opposed to, you know, cause now everything's a fucking term, not like the modern art world, but the modern art. Right, right, world. right, right. Distinction. The, you the modern, it. the modern industry, the scene, Madison Avenue, right, New York right. times, right. New Yorker art scene. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, not just, I'm not just picking on New York, you know, it's mm -hmm. pretty uh, ubiquitous that this is the case. Miami, at, at that, yeah, LA. Yeah, at that level, it's an income, you know, people that are really rich and really interested in using their money to move art around or whatever they're doing with it. Right. Um, generally, I think have absolutely no idea what they're doing. 
They have right. no idea what art is. They have no idea what the point of art is. You know, if you ask them, they would probably want to give you a 500 page book to read. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for a two sentence definition or something. I don't, you know, I need to know that you understand what it is you're talking about and dealing with. And right. I don't think those people do. I think they're seeing them as, um, you know, investments. Exactly. And, and, and a purely, you know, functioning, uh, uh, fiscal light. Right. Um, and if they do see beyond that to the more value to, to, to seeing some deeper value to the art, I think it's based mostly on, how they perceive the rest of their community to perceive mm -hmm. its exactly. essential value. And that's usually then tied to, to the financial uh, uh, right. value of the commodity, which, you know, there's a great line from the end of my favorite movie where uh, um, the characters basically it's take place in the late thirties. And this character plays uh or he plays this like a oil or a steel uh, rich steel guy, yeah. like an Andrew Carnegie kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. And he's buying art, essentially laundering money to Mussolini through okay. this attache that's come to New York. Mm -hmm. And he and the other character who's uh, Gar uh, not Garrison Hurst, um, James uh, William Randolph Hurst. Mm. Garrison Hurst is a football player from the 1990s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, uh, so this cultural, cultural attache from Italy, you know, she's saying, giving him the art and, you know, He's giving her the bag, bag of money. You know, they're in his office at his you know mansion or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, he doesn't really say anything. The the painting's got a, it's you know wrapped. And so he goes, you know, here, okay, great, thanks for coming. And she goes, well, what do you think about it? And he just goes, oh yeah, it's great, right. And she goes, so what are you gonna do with it? And he goes, oh. And then he actually unwraps it and picks it up, sets it on the mantle behind his desk. He goes, I think I'll hang it here behind my desk. And she says something to the effect of, it's such a shame to see great art rot away out of sight or something. Right. And basically, you know, that element of art is supposed to be experienced. People are supposed to be able to experience this. If it's rotting away in this room where only four people ever really come, you know, and right. two of them are, are the butler and the maid, that's really limiting to, wow. you know, it was like a Rodin or something, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact painting, but, uh, you know, relatively well known, uh, classical artist. I think it was a Rodin anyway, but that's kind of, that's where I see, you know, and a lot of times these wealthier folks today will do it, you know, so they can display it at a museum so the public can see it, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, for those people, they're seeing it more as a, as an investment, as a fiscal asset. Right. Um, and the intrinsic value that they might find is that the general public might want to come and see it. So maybe I could charge the money for it. Right. And like, look good, you know, for the, oh, right. I mean, yeah. And it seems like you're doing something philanthropic. Exactly. Exactly. By allowing art to do what it should do anyway. And right. Be interact, you know, be able to be encountered and interacted with. Right. Interesting. Um, because yeah, and that's you know, the one of the interesting things, and I'm we'll have to do a intellectual property episode because that's a whole can of worms when it comes to the art uh, thing. And I have pretty strong uh, idea of what I think what makes sense to me is is the way to think about it. But I could be wrong. Um, uh, point being that I think the kind of burgeoning concept of the non fungible token might be a, a neat and will, I think, become a neat way for more grassroots artists to interact um, and monetize their art. So, yeah, I actually, I just saw an article about that. I feel like I don't, well, wait, let me speak to the point that you made. Um, a few points that you made. One, one thing that, that I agreed with that you were saying is, yeah, you know, I think they do see it as um, an investment. Uh, and I think the evidence is, you know, how much can someone really have an emotional connection with something that they were advised to buy by like a financial advisor? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I think this would be really good in your portfolio. You know what I mean? Like there's not, you know, how much can something resonate with you? And if it does, then that's totally secondary. 
You know what I mean? It's like you mm -hmm. bought like a, a Tesla and you're like, oh, I actually really like driving this thing. You know what I mean? That's sort of that <laughs> that level yeah. of like liking something. Yeah, it just so right. happens. Like it just thought. so happens that I like right. it. Right. And I like, didn't buy it because I like it. I just so happen to also like it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, you know, he unwraps the painting after saying like, it's great. Um, so there's that. And then, and then I thought that, um, I just thought how cool it would be for there to be like a museum type art space that was free, that wasn't, you know, uh, sort of curated and, and enabled by the powers that be, because there's not, I don't really know of a lot of that. And I am fortunate enough to be dare I say at the nucleus of a community right now that, you know, could, I think something like that might be possible. Um, and I just, that just gets me thinking because it's like, yeah, that's not really, that's not really something that's done very much. Um, go ahead. See, See uh, I, I, it's, it's done. done. I've, I've been to those types of, of visual art shows, usually mm -hmm. not really like a museum more of an art show right right uh, where you've got you know 12 different local artists that the one that i remember specifically my uh son's wife wasn't wife at the time but they had just started dating uh she did one up in north seattle and it was like in the basement of a record store or something that whoever owned the building was like yeah you can use it on a saturday night after i'm closed you know i'll just keep the top locked but there's an entrance in the back you go straight down to the basement yeah use it right and so they did that use that space a couple of times and it was just like a weird little basement with a couple like little alcove sections and kind of the artists just each got a little corner and put their mm -hmm. stuff up and you know it was free to to go and you could uh, purchase the art if you'd like but um you know, so I know that stuff kind of does exist, but I think as far as like studios, oftentimes, particularly if you look over, you know, back into the different artistic movements, you know, a lot of time it kind of starts in the cafes or whatever. And then somebody says, oh, I know so-and-so that can, you know, get a space. Right. And then it's still kind of grassroots. But if that artistic movement gets some traction, it soon gets, you know, really big and usually overflows its bounds. And then you know, it comes in with the, the monetization becomes so much and the valuation becomes so high that it actually kind of takes on a life of its own. I think about the impressionist movement, which started with just a couple of guys in a studio and ended up, you know, there was 12 or 15, you know, really solid impressionists. And fortunately, I think for them, it was after a lot of them had died, that that whole movement became a lot more corporatized. Certainly nothing like it is now, you know, you can buy a five dollar handbag with the water lilies on it at yeah yeah tj maxx again right um, uh point being that the it, it always seems like it starts that way it always seems like artistic movements start that way and then you usually get co-opted i would say that changed after world war ii but um when folks like Guggenheim and a lot of the oil barons and these, you know, people like were portrayed uh, in that film started handpicking the art that they wanted to, you know, focus on. And they moved away from symbolism and into contemporary noise art, you know, right. the Jack Pollock, you know, just colors and sh shapes and shit and yeah. you know, just meaningless to me, meaningless. It'd be like taking a typewriter and just randomly hitting a bunch of keys and saying, "Oh, I wrote this novel." It's like that's not a right. fucking painting. That's not a novel. Yeah. There's you're just slopping shit on a canvas. Anybody, I'm mean, really anybody could do that. Right. He wasn't yeah. a great artist. He was the the front runner. He was the the yeah. centerpiece for this shift away from yeah classic you know classic symbol driven art. Right. Or if not symbol, at least like depicting Painting. something that exists in nature. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I would, I would say like, just not, not like I'm the keeper of the keys here, but like, I, I do think that, yeah, Jackson Pollock, like, fuck that. I'm sorry. But that's, you know, I just, you know, I can't <laughs> okay. like, I, okay. So no, far, no, I, I so fully, far this episode's going well. That, that was a great, point. great. No, 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 no. That's no, because again, as an artist, it's like, you know, that's like, if you're a musician, and then someone like 
gets on stage and they take a shit in a tuba in front of 20,000 people and then people stand up and give them a standing ovation. They're like, brilliant, <laughs> so bold. I love the emotion. Then you're like, wait, what the fuck? Like I trained for years to be able to play my instrument and this dude is literally taking a shit, you know? So like in that sense, Jackson Pollock, I feel, took a shit on many canvases <laughs> and is, you know, like that's that's really, you know, it's the same way, not to keep bringing it back to music, but this is a thing, like that's what, that's what really messes things up is when someone is praised for doing something that denigrates that art form. Yeah. And because then it's like you've just you you you've you've really screwed the pooch and you've created this precedent, you know, where now people it's like the YouTube algorithm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's if you listen to some oh, yeah. of these YouTube creators, it's like, well, what what do you how do you decide what video to make? And they're like, well, I just like scroll through YouTube and then I see what's popular and what's trending and like I look at the clickbait thumbnails of other people and I see what has the most views. And so it's you get into a weird situation where it's not very organic at all. And what these people, what, what is, what people end up creating or striving to create, it becomes this weird recursive loop where, you know, their mm -hmm. reasoning mm -hmm. is not like, oh, you know, I, I was really driven or I felt really passionate about, you know, interviewing so-and-so. They're like, well, you know, it seems like people creating content on topic A or topic B seem to really be blowing up right now. So it seems like the mm -hmm. algorithm, which is not even, we don't even know what that is. We literally mm -hmm. do not know what that is or what its motivations are or what drives it. And yet I think it's the computer from the end of Westworld season three, by the way. It's just my... <laughs> yeah, man, I need to watch Westworld season three, huh? I You almost don't, I mean... You almost well, don't so we're only watch, just living it. Like it's... You almost don't need to watch the first two seasons. I did. I Which started good, watching the first two. But they the just, third season, it's like you don't even really need to know what's going on with the story. You just look at the shit that they're showing you and you're just like, oh, oh this came out. This debuted. This show debuted on March 15th of 2020, basically the day before the world went into lockdown or two days or whatever. Anyway. Wow. I'm going to have to watch this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the, for the tip. But um, anyway. But yeah. The algorithm. The algorithm, it's, I, I got a kind of a tangent. The, the point I'm trying to make no, is No, it's a good point. The, the point, yeah, it's just... Uh, but what I wanted to say is that I feel like when you're doing something like what Jackson Pollock was doing, nobody would be able to convince me that he was throwing that paint onto that canvas, like thinking to himself like oh yeah like the way i splashed this red paint on there will make people feel this emotion mm -hmm. now the way i'm gonna splash this white paint you know it's really gonna go with like no like he was i mean let's get real probably on a lot of drugs and you know very like hyped up on this like egoic thing certainly after people took an interest in him definitely definitely drank a lot right i know right. that for sure I, and, and i've heard stuff yeah. about like meth which or you know uh, amphetamines which in the 40s and 50s were over the counter basically they were ubiquitous yeah, yeah. i mean jack so, Kerouac, yeah there was like a thing it was like probably like coffee is now but more yeah. but what i wanted to say is so i just I, I felt it was my my obligation to to kind of say jackson pollock you know no like <laughs> If I, if I was teaching a child about art right now, you know, like uh, the, the toddler level kind of like uh, crash course on like the do's and don'ts of art, I would say Jackson Pollock, hell no. Uh, Kandinsky, okay. Like, especially for a toddler. Like, but at least, <laughs> the thing, but like, no, but for real, I mean, Kandinsky, okay. like, when you look at a Kandinsky, like, you do feel, you do, you think or feel something, and you're like, huh, well, this yeah. is something. When I look Wait, at Jackson yeah. Pollock, yeah, I you're think, right. this is nothing. This, is, this nothing. is not any, this is, like, zoomed in on one of those, like, rugs from, like, Walmart. <laughs> That's what a Jackson <laughs> Pollock is like. It's a macro shot of, like, spackle. <laughs> You know, or or whatever, and so yeah. So I just wanted to say, I maybe I'm just defending myself because the painting that my friend Mel and I made was more like, I guess it was abstract, but like it was not. It was by no means Jackson Pollock esque. It was just like, 
a little violent and dark, but like it was like brush strokes and mm -hmm. damn, I wish I could show it. I, I'm actually probably gonna put it up in our in our um, in our living room soon. But it's yeah. But I just just a statement on that. It's like the way that this piece of art was made is I rescued this extremely heavy, dense piece of shelf wood, like dense, like it this it's heavy, like you couldn't. Unless you like nailed it into a stud, like you could not hang this on your wall. It would tear through the wall. Mm -hmm. It's not that kind of a thing. It's like pretty large, like I don't know, at least like like it's big. Like, yeah, it's like the size of this screen, honestly. Whatever that means. Um and uh and it's really and I what 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 drew me to it was I was like, wow, this is like so dense. And I was thinking of like, you know, how the old masters would always use oil. They didn't really use canvas. Nobody used canvas back then because it was flimsy as fuck and like mm -hmm. really easily damaged. And it had a grain on it. And if you really wanted to get crazy with, you know, your textures and your, you know, blending in terms of oil paint, it really helps to have a smooth surface. You know what I mean? Why would you want something grainy if you're trying to get like a really nice finish? So so I was like, yeah, it's going to be so cool. So I started this painting probably around two years ago. And I sanded it down and I gessoed it, I think around two years ago. Maybe maybe more like a year ago. But I was going through some shit. I was trying to like kind of find myself. And I just remember being like, I'm going to paint, you know, <laughs> it's going to, yeah, yeah. life is going to be worth it or whatever, you know, sort of like this search. And uh and I sanded it down and I gessoed it. And then I painted this very like womb like, according to my friend Mel, who was like the one that decided that this is the piece of art we would work on. Because our goal was just to paint. We did, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But she was like drawn to it. And yeah, I just drew this like little, it was like, you know, white gessoed square. And then there was like this like circular orb in the middle. And it had like this very like, gestural like dry stroke kind of going through it it looked almost like snake like or according to her it was like umbilical mm -hmm. and then i just left it there and it was just marinating in like not so great energy for like a year well or a year or a year and a half while the world just went to shit <laughs> and just soaked in this energy and then you know i brought it here to my, where i'm living now and like allowed it to sort of breathe. And I feel like the, um, the accumulated topsoil of, of years, you know, of, of vibes that had sort of like covered it finally was able to like breathe a little bit and germinate. And it germinated into this crazy fucking painting that was one of the first times I've really felt like without necessarily trying to represent anything or trying to use like a symbol, because in my mind, there are two ways of creating art that will affect people. There is sort of like looking through your mental repertoire of symbols and being like, hmm, let me think, like, what would be, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that could be like, oh, I want to use the alchemical symbol for Venus and then, you know, whatever. And again, that's really big right now, too. Or it could be like, I want to draw a tree. So again, you know, things like the alchemical symbols, that's a much more standardized symbol language versus like a tree is a much more broadly intelligible symbol where like there's an infinite number of depictions of trees, all of which, you know, would be pretty easily recognizable. So well, then, well, you, then get you get to the, to the, to the, to the uh, uh, if, if I walk, I walk in, the in the door and hang, and hang my, my coat, coat on that, on that thing, thing that's standing, standing up, up freestanding, freestanding in my living room. room, did I just put my coat on a tree? Right, right. <laughs> on my hat? So yeah, the tree, yes, I, I appreciate that. The symbol, like something like painting a tree has a lot more interpretability than kind of the more strictly uh, lost symbols like the alchemical ones or what have you. Right, and... I, yeah, I feel like it's it's more. Um, that's what it kind of my my not final point, but my final point on this leg of my journey of verbal diarrhea is the uh, <laughs> there's like a more intuitive symbol language and a less intuitive symbol language, and I would say the less intuitive one comes from like prefrontal conscious mind where it's sort of more calculating. You know, it's like. Mm -hmm what do I want people to feel? What do I want to represent? And like 
what do I think we'll accomplish? And you're sort of, it's like the, uh, the abstraction, the trial and error, you know, where you're like, hmm, maybe this, or no, maybe not that. I don't think that'll work. You're, you're calculating, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in other people's shoes, sort of reverse engineering, if you will, mm -hmm. the experience of the art, which, full disclosure, I do this a lot. I mean, I love ink, I love symbols, I love playing with symbols, I love typography, you know, I, I to, to, to my own detriment, I've always just, you know, people are like, well, what kind of art do you make? And I'm like, well, I, I like it all, you know, it's like, what, why, why would you go into a field if you didn't want to explore every, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, and then there's the, the, the more intuitive one is sort of like, you just allow yourself to channel and not everyone can do this and actually people have sort of told me because it, it's interesting this is kind of a I think would be a, a good jumping off point because I feel like that I really that the, the word pandering that I mentioned earlier I feel like so much there's just there's so much that ne that can be said about that and this dovetails um I think decently with it you know there's there's the way of making art where you are, it's more reactionary. You know, you're like, you have a goal, you have a, an agenda sort of like, that's bound up with your ego. Mm -hmm. The, the art, you know, the artist is mm -hmm. like, well, I want to be seen a certain way. You know, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to, uh, I want my community to look at whatever I'm about to create and think, wow, he's so spiritual. So I'm going to put a big fat ohm in the middle. And then I feel I feel that way. It's not from a spiritual aspect, but about the Andy Warhol school of art. Now I have some appreciation for Andy Warhol and some of the stuff that he did. Yeah. But I think that especially later in his career, he was about making art that would maintain the Andy Warhol image and brand. Right. Right. That's a whole Andy Warhol is like the bizarre world. He's he's yeah. a controversial yeah. artist because. Yeah even if you don't like his art, like I, I don't really, I mean, the pop yeah, um, stuff I think is, is just repulsive. I'm just like, what the fuck is this? But there, the time, yeah, you can't deny that nobody was really doing that before him. You know, he like broke new ground and, and it's actually, that's, that's one person where it's almost tough to say on any individual piece because his style is a lot more diverse than a lot of people give him credit for. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like at some point, I don't remember where, where, or when in my life this happened, but somebody was like scrolling through some stuff. And I guess they found like an, a very early Andy Warhol, like sketch or print or drawing. And it was like this, like weird stylized kind of like ballerina and a tutu type, just like a really gay, like, I don't know, it was whatever, <laughs> you know, it was, I'm sorry. That's the word A very, no, <laughs> Well, a very, very flamboyant. Yeah. Saturated. He, that's who he was too. Yeah. Um, that's a good thing to, you know, to, to, yeah. Anyway, to be, I, I actually, yeah. And I actually got to see an Andy Warhol exhibit. Was I college age? I think mm -hmm. it was the strangest thing because it was at this, I grew up in Colorado in kind of the Southern central part of Colorado is Colorado Springs, which is a fairly, conservative christian community the yeah, focus on the family group is there um and there's this little college i think it's colorado college i think is the name of it mm -hmm. little kind of liberal arts school and they would just have these weird like andy like they had a, the andy warhol display it was just like <laughs> in colorado springs of all places but that's really funny uh, me and my mom actually drove down and uh, i was there was some stuff of his that i think was pretty decent you know i think the tomato soup can is kind of stupid but yeah that's um it's unfortunate. he also kind of had a sense of humor about himself and about his art because he spun off a lot of kind of the soup can style things for a while and yeah. most of them were kind of poking fun at the whole concept um some of them anyway uh but anyway my my, my big my big uh, respect for Andy Warhol has less to do with the visual art he made and more to do with the artistic community that he inspired. Right. Uh, and particularly how he was able to get the Velvet Underground, one of the most, I think, influential bands on music itself, mm -hmm. uh, kind of give them the space to 
like you say, explore the craft of music because those guys were doing shit in the 60s that nobody else... I mean, the Beatles are doing some fun stuff, but the Velvet Underground and that whole Andy Warhol right. factory scene... Yeah, just, industrial chic thing. Yeah, it was just its own cultural phenomena and you know, I don't really care for Lou Reed post Velvet Underground, but I love Velvet Underground. I'm glad that that music happened. I'm glad it, Andy Warhol had the space and capacity to, to germinate that and the films and stuff that he, he made were very interesting. Right, he did right. some really good work with film. Um, the whole concept of in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. He actually made a film Wow. where he just it's just a somebody you know a different person every i think it's every 60 seconds and they're just sitting there and it's just that per you're just looking at the person's face and they're just sitting there on film and then it cuts to the next person and so that whole concept he then wow. turned into this film experience where you're just looking at people and that's how they get you know it's self-fulfilling this is how they become famous and he also had quotes later in his life where you know he would riff on his you know that quote he had a great quote that was in 15 minutes everyone will be famous so he's right. ripping on, so you know. So he was just kind of an interesting cat, and I think what he wow. kind of did to give other artists the room to breathe and to grow mm -hmm. was probably, to me, his best contribution. Um, right. his, the the static or the visual art itself, you know, the paintings and whatnot, take or leave, screen prints, most of them. But yeah, yeah, wow. Anyway, no, Andy Warhol I tangent. That's uh yeah I I, I was gonna <laughs> say of uh, I I think that really the most like admirable thing I shouldn't say admirable especially identifying as an artist myself that's kind of lame but um I just feel like you know the thing with art you know it's and it's, it's really exemplified in like people like you know Van Gogh and like you were saying the impressionists where it's like you know you're just like a struggling kind of like you know. Uh, alcoholic or alcoholic adjacent dude, you know, trying to like have your affairs and like shack up in someone's attic and like paint the bathers and, try, try and smoke a little opium from time yeah, to time. Like, exactly, you know, you just trying to just you know live your life and whatever, do you know, hang out in your hashish parlors and and then you know, two hundred years later, people are like, it's brilliant, it's brilliant. He was a visionary, you know, and like Van Gogh's, you know, like like like. The, it, that really is the epitome of like you just never know what yeah. your art will lead to. You yeah. you just don't know. And I think for me, um, one of the things I love about art is that it feels unlimited. It, it because it doesn't matter. You know, it's it's the one thing that I can do where I feel like I am not playing by anybody's rules at all. You know, I yeah. can do whatever I want and it's like, it's safe from what's happening to the world. The only thing that will be degraded is maybe the world's ability to appreciate or understand what the fuck I'm putting into my art. But the art itself is not reduced, you know, whereas right. like even using language, you know, or, or trying to go into the sciences and getting a degree in the sciences, you know, there's like this same, the same phenomenon we've been talking about of like standardization, you know, everything's always being standardized. There's like mm -hmm. the, the codified, like, oh, well, we decided you're not allowed to do this anymore, you know, or, or, you know, and it's, there's like psychology is the perfect example. You know, it's like, well, we decided that, you know, being gay is not a disorder anymore. Mm -hmm. But now we came up with this thing called gender identity, which up to you to decide what the fuck that is. You know what I mean? But now, so mm -hmm. now, now we can like, you know, now you can go to a psychiatrist and, 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 you know, be like 10 years old. And then that psychiatrist based on their medical opinion can decide whether you really do have gender dysphoria and that you are eligible for this like reassignment thing or whether you're just imagining it. <laughs> That's where we've gotten to because it's like, it's this standardized world, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like art is it sort of stands apart from that because that's a really hard thing to standardize. And, you know, I haven't looked at some of this like art made by AI, but people said it was terrible. But, but that brings me back to the NFT thing. 
I don't really know that much about the NFT thing. Does it have to, like, it has to be digital? Because, I mean, well, when I hear, like, that's going to be a way for people to monetize their art, I'm like, damn, I should, like, make this shit. What's the deal? It has to be digital? What it, and it's, it's the, the value is in the uniqueness, right? Yeah, yeah the, the value is it's an individual, individual token, token with, with the blockchain, blockchain history, uh, observable, transparent, but unique. Um, and so, if you know, just a unit of that. So, yeah, I mean, it's authenticity. It's authenticated. Whatever the the artwork is can be authenticated by its NFT. Most of them are digital assets, but you could certainly have a non fungible token connected to a specific physical piece of artwork, and have the NFT would then act as like a certificate of authentication, essentially. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be doable. I don't think a lot of people are doing it that way, which. You know, there might be room for, for uh, you know, a look to see if it's, you know, marketable. If something be people be interested, but I think it'd be doable. I mean, theoretically, there's no reason it wouldn't. Right. No, I you just hold a digital asset that would just back up that that physical thing is what you say it is. It would. Would photography qualify for that? Like, could you? You know, that's yeah, you could cool. definitely do photography. Definitely. Oh, a lot of a lot of yeah. Cool. Wait, really? Photographers. Yeah. I don't know a lot of photographers, but I should say a lot of uh, photography would be is a very easy, right? You know, digital photograph with a unique identifier, a unique you know file that can only be accessed through the unique identifier that links it back to its blockchain, which is the token. Mm -hmm. Yeah, photographs are easy because they're usually all digital anyway. Right. Yeah, because I mean, I love photography. I almost, I almost wish I never found photography in a way, because you know, I was, you know, for for uh, a lazy white dude who's you know as addicted to novelty as the rest of us, but happens to be an you know an artist, whatever that means. You know, photography is like, man, it is like the uh, the the death knell for like discipline or having a work ethic because it's like well i can use a bunch of materials and potentially spill paint or paint thinner all over my rug and like do this stuff it still might turn out really shittily and then i'll just be like wow the fuck am i doing with my life or i can take my digital camera out to nature which is already gorgeous <laughs> and, and, and perfect like really from all angles but you know then that's but that's one of the things they say about photography is like although it is just pressing a button what you produce as an end result is really one of the best sort of litmus tests of like whether you are an artist or a visionary or not, because it's literally, you know, anyone can press the button, but not anyone can see what looks aesthetic. You know what I mean? Like there is a, there's something there. I don't know. Maybe I'm just saying that because I want to believe that like I, I have something. But <laughs> Well, I don't, I, I... I've always been interested in photography. My dad was actually a photographer and mm -hmm. so he's not really much of a photographer anymore, but I think you, I know he went to journalism school and I think, I don't know if he studied photography or if, I know he didn't. Anyway, he, he studied it at some point. We had pictures around the house growing up that he had taken when he was young and had a mustache. Anyway, um, love mustaches. he took one picture. I'd always, makes me smile it was in like a parking garage and he took a picture up at one of those you know the the uh reflectors you know it's like the lens sit up in the corner so you can see yeah, around the corner. Yeah, yeah so he's standing underneath it and takes a picture and so you can see most of the thing you know behind him but the, you can also see the camera reflected in the surface and it's not necessarily the greatest shot ever but it always makes me laugh because he had longish hair and a mustache and basically, I remember the mustache. Yeah, I think I was like five when he got rid of it. But my, my whole life, and then he gradually lost all of his hair. But you know, so that's like the one picture I remember. Oh, yeah, that was dad used to have a mustache back in the early 80s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I wanted to say, uh, so I wanted to say this because we we're talking about the, the algorithm. Mm -hmm. as kind of the influencer of what people think is good right you know um and what people decide to yeah like they're they're bound yeah. up with each other yeah. 
or people think, you know, the algorithm makes them think that everybody thinks that this is good. Exactly. Kind of like how the search engine makes everybody think. Right. That everybody and I take that a step, uh, or I could like to take that a step back because I think all these things, you know, the algorithm is a refinement of the search engine, but you can take that back a step or two, maybe at this point, you know, you can look at things like the Oscars. You can look at things like the Emmys and the music awards. You can look at things like just the existence of a top 40 Right. This is the best. This is the best music available today, right. as as decided by three record companies. Right. Or three companies that own all of the record companies. Maybe it's right. four, but right. no more than five. Right. So it's a handful of people deciding and telling all these radio stations, which are now owned by the same companies that own the record labels, telling the radio stations, here's what you play for the next two weeks, and then you know we'll send you the new package with the new songs and whatever. But the, the top 40 has totally, totally set the tone. And, and I think it's intentional. I think there is a definite, have been an intention probably since the 50s or 60s. Absolutely. Even, that has set music down a path of, if you want to be a famous rock star musician, if you want to be known at all, you have to fit into whatever the top 40 box is at the time. And if not, good luck. You know, I you're going to be playing nightclubs. I think it's pretty clear what that box is now. You know, you look at yeah. her, like Katy Perry. Who, yeah. Who was or that, that shit girl. with the, what was, is it the Emmys or the, the music awards? Is that the Emmys? Anyway, the music awards, this last, I didn't see the it or BMA, I heard BMA, about before. The VMAs. With the, the lesbian yeah. Cardi B bed dance, whatever it was. I only saw yeah. a clip of it, but this is what yeah. this is what we're passing off as as the height of of what we're doing artistically at right. this point in human history right. really like have yeah. you well and Rubens Rubens was light years ahead of you right you alive in the 16 fucking hundreds for crying out loud well I think I think what's really interesting is that back in the day, artists didn't really have a chance to like become role models because they sort of occupied a different place in society. It's true. It was, a, it, and I think now people That's have true. really, you know, people have really lost, I don't even know if lost is the right word. They are not able to have the respect or the understanding because being an artist is like one of the, it's like one of the most shamanic roles that you can take on in society. Certainly. Because you're literally just transmuting, you know, you're like, oh, okay, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Nobody wants to feel it or deal with it. But like, I actually don't have a choice. Somehow I ended mm -hmm. up in this position where like, this is what makes me feel alive is like tapping into like when I make like, you know, and there's different, it's actually kind of interesting because I don't know if have you ever seen that show Heroes? It's like, yeah, from like 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, some of it. I haven't really Quite seen a bit of it, much actually. Of it, but in it, there's this dude that like does heroin and paints the future. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. There is a character like that. And I just, that like, that archetype kind of stayed with me. And I feel like that's really, because again, that like, you know, when the word artist is, is far too broad, you know, like, um, you know, there's, I mean, you, you could be an artist and you could be one of these people on Instagram that like only paints cats, you know, and like, you <laughs> like have like 40 million followers, and, like not very well, you know, and that's, that's and I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you my favorite example. You can be paid minimum wage put on a green shirt and a little yellow visor and you can all of a sudden become a sandwich artist just like that. So anybody can be an artist. Yeah. Cats right. on Instagram, subway, right. whatever. Yeah, man. But yeah, so, you know, but then, so that, right. So, and this kind of goes back to um, what I was saying earlier about, you know, there are different ways of like, there's, you know, you can sort of click on your, your more calculating conscious mind, which, which is very like, you know, th there is a, a more egoic way. There's a more egoic way of getting it, of coming at everything. Right. You know, like there's a more egoic way of giving to charity where you're like, Oh, this will make me look really good. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. no, and I can write it off on my taxes. Like, yeah, great. 
you know, and like, you know, this dude's found it, you know, uh, Bill Gates owes me some money. So like, I'll donate to his foundation. So, you know, he'll owe me double fit. There's that version. And then there's like coming at it from a more, you know, pick whatever word you want, emotional or intuitive place where you're like, wow, I can't believe, you know, this is happening to these children in Yemen. I'm going to give money to them because like, your god you know what i mean like they've been they, 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 they need to clean up after the drone strikes right right um and and, and they don't have jobs because they're children and i think with art it's kind of like you know you can come at it from this place of and and i've always i've always like rejected this kind of thing i mean everybody does it if you you know if you want to go on social media you want to get popular you want to do the self-promotion is like the same as what I'm about to describe. And that is you sort of sit at the drawing board and you're like, hmm, okay, what's a good idea here? Like what's what's a good vector to follow that will increase the likelihood of me basically getting what I want on a short, medium and long time scale. You know, you can do that with a art you can do that with a business plan. You can do that with a fucking lemonade stand. You, you know, you can do it with, with, with anything. But art is, is one of those things. Then you can, you know, and, and I, I would say there's a lot more people, even if they were sort of like just a doodler or someone that enjoyed drawing or whatever, painting, in order to quote unquote get popular, I think it's, it's virtually a requirement that you have to go through that stage, you know, like, like, again to come back to this concept of like standardization you know like like that's what which of course in my mind being an artist is is fundamentally antithetical truly like truly being a true artist again whatever that means in my mind in my spirit is antithetical to this sort of thing of like well johnny you got to get practical like you know i mean you're, you're somebody's got to pay the bills you know if you want to make money like you got to you know you got to put your your hand on the the, the pulse of uh, of the world, and you know what's hot and what's going to get popular. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, everybody's on the Instagram, they're on the Facebook. You know, you got to get big on the Facebook. You know, it's sort of like, uh, so you have to pander in the end. You know, there's more classy version of pandering, but you know, like if I look on Instagram, like you know, you have to have like a style. Like there's this one woman that just paints like foxes and rabbits, and like let me tell you. Those are some damn good paintings of foxes. Like I look at them and I'm like, wow. Wow. Like I cannot say anything against this. However, it does make me a little sad that because of the internet, I don't know. It's just like, well, and I, you know, I don't fault people that too much for, for really honing one particular aspect of a craft like just crafting drawings of really good boxes. Mm -hmm. If people are interested in that, go for it. Right. But I don't consider that if it's artistic, it's functional first. And the function that it serves is just to be pleasing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Art at its core, and I should probably get around to what I define as art because it's going to be important for the whole rest of the series. Yeah. But if it's art, it's very and much more like craft, I would say. It's, it's a craft item more than an art piece. The way that, let's see, what's another good example of a craft? The way that a lamp... You know, it's, it might, you might, you can have a standard, you know, Ikea lamp that costs $10, or you can have, you know, a $40 lamp that's styled in a way that you want. Yeah, it might be pleasing to look at and it serves its purpose, but it's not necessarily meant to be interacted with as an object of art. Mm -hmm. It might be object d'art and, you know, right. you know, slightly different thing, but um, the point is, uh, there's a lot of stuff like that that, you know, it's kind of the line between art and craft. And I certainly have no problem with craft people. I wish I was more... Uh, crafty? Manually crafty. Yeah, like you were talking about working with wood. My brother started doing some woodworking over the last several years. And it's like, man, I, that 
Yeah, I wish weird. that I uh, I wish that I cared enough to get started because and photography is kind of the same way. I was always interested in photography, but I never really picked it up. That's what I was actually getting to say and got uh, sidelined by my dad's mustache. Um, but I just never like got into the craft, and I think photography is a good example of as far as the craft goes that anybody can pick up a camera and snap a picture like you're saying, right. but the more comfortable you are, the more you know what your apparatus is and what it does, the more you know about the settings on a camera and what you can do with it, and then the more you know about dark room, whether it's physical dark room or digital dark room kind of stuff, you know, you can know a lot about and really craft and hone and tweak, and I think Ansel Adams is a great example. He was a really good photographer, but a lot of what he did was craft photography. Stuff that looks really cool as part of the scenery you know, on a wall of somebody's office, but isn't meant to be a, a something that you deeply interact with. Some of his photographs are amazing. Don't get me wrong. But there's a lot of it where it's kind of landscapey, almost craft, a craft piece, which, again, fine. He certainly yeah. did well for himself with that. Um, and I think he does brush into the realm of art with a lot of his uh, photography or some of his photography, at least. Um and so there's an interesting thing to me. There are, I think, artists who do kind of walk that line where most of what they're doing is kind of crafting, you know, but then every now you, they've got the artistic chops and every now and then they do something that's a little above and beyond or, or different. And I, I don't think that it's, uh, there's not really many big named artists that are like that or a few, but um, for the most part, it's, you know, folks, I think like you and me that are, you know, yeah, yeah, drawing and this and ink, but also maybe, you know, working with wood and also trying, you know, just trying these different ways to to express ourselves because that's what it really comes down to. Um, yes. And I, sometimes, yeah. sometimes you express yourself better or less better. You know, sometimes the expression of the thing is about its functionality more so than it is about what it's communicating from an emotional or, or a, a psychological standpoint or anything like this. So I'm going to gonna use that all to roll into and then i'll you know tell maybe i won't tell it quick than yet um it's just okay so i was teasing earlier that i was talking to people and nobody could really give me a coherent definition of art right so i've crafted mine and i should have written it down so i wouldn't be fumbling through it and making it look like i don't know what the hell i'm talking about which i probably don't um but here's kind of my definition of art so first of all we have to understand art is an experience um, I'll frequently use, you know, work of art or piece of art, or even sometimes say, you know, this artwork, whatever, um, kind of casually, but know that when I'm really talking about what art is, I define it as an experience. Right. And art is the experience of seeing the world from someone else's perspective right. through some object that, that, that has been created or, or maybe not even the artist's perspective. Um, I, think like John Steinbeck was great as a writer mm -hmm. at allowing the audience to see through the eyes of a bunch of different characters and kind of get into their heads. I think that's one of the reasons why his novels are uh, so beloved is he was not necessarily using the whole of his novel to kind of get you into one perspective, one worldview, but trying to show you many different ones. William Faulkner was also really good at that. Um, so it, it, it's the experience of of having of seeing someone else's worldview, and mm -hmm. essentially the goal is then to imagine what your world would be like if you carried that worldview or some aspect of that worldview. The whole goal then being to understand that your worldview that you have is changeable; it's different from others, mm -hmm. um, and it's built on the things that you've experienced and things that you've been told, and things that you've learned, and things right. that you have thought about to the greater or lesser degree that you've actually engaged in critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that there's all these different, you know, all these different things that I just listed go into making each individual distinct worldview, and you start to realize that everybody's got a little slightly different worldview in some way, now you start to talk about that trial and error of what is a good, healthy worldview. Right. And art is a great way to say, Rather than living my life this way, I'll put it in a character and see if we can learn the lesson. 
see if we can learn whether living life with this worldview works or not. So then when I read that, I go, oh, I had this part of that person's worldview. And they ended up with a really unhealthy outcome at the end of the story because of that worldview. And therefore, maybe I should rethink the way that I'm looking at the world. Mm. And it's, you know, I'm talking a lot about storytelling now, but this applies to uh, uh, static art as well. Um, in the sense that you are literally, you know, if it's a statue or a painting or a drawing, whatever, you are literally providing a frame where someone is seeing a snapshot of whatever it is from your perspective, from whatever perspective you're communicating. So it's a much shorter story sometimes, but it can be deeply packed because you can even, it has no temporal existence. You can stand in front of a painting as long as you want. Right. Whereas with a film or a book, it ends and you, that, that's it. I mean, you could watch it again or you could go see the play again, but, but it won't that, be that art experience has terminated. Right. You look at a piece of art, you go to the next room, that art experience is terminated. Maybe you come back and you have another artistic experience with that same piece, but that's a different art work. Right. That's a different artistic experience. So that's kind of my, you know, it's, it's about communication of a worldview so that people can say, hey, maybe I should think about if I'm living a right life, a life that's going to be successful. And what ultimately all that will come down to is in harmony with natural law, because a lot of times you see characters that have struggles, and this is huge in literature, their fundamental character flaw is not they were a hero or they didn't fit this classical definition of this or that. Or... It's simply that these yeah. people had a flawed, uh, amoral worldview, and that leads them to destruction time and time again. So just, you know, ultimately, we're all trying to live our best lives, and art is a way to say, hey, what about this way of living? What do you think? Let's think about this. Oh, maybe I'll try a little bit of that and see how it works. And just getting beyond the fact that you have to accept who you are as who you are, and there's no way to change. There's no way to, you know, that's why we love character arcs, seeing characters change. We love seeing that because we somewhere know, hey, I've probably got something that I could do better in my life. I could change. And I think a lot of the world around us in the last, you know, however many decades has started to try and say, nope, you are this thing. You cannot change. And it right. goes back to that gender identity, too. You might be confused about your gender, yeah. but it's got to be one of these things. Right. And actually, my, my, my one friend, the same friend that I've been talking about, you know, she... Um, she feels very strongly about, well, I don't want to give too much away about her. For all I know, I mean, she's an artist too, so we'll, prob we'll probably have her on the fucking show at one sure, point sure. if you're down. But, yeah, but yeah. basically she feels really strongly about the trans thing because uh, essentially her view on it is like, you know, people have existed and engaged in all kinds of sexual behavior since time immemorial. And there's always been whatever. And it's like, you know, maybe, yeah, in the 1800s, you know, you, there, were, there was no, you know, Pulse nightclub <laughs> to go to. You know, the, you, you'd probably, you know, if you were like uh, Oscar Wilde or whatever, you would end up, you know, probably in a marriage of convenience with some slightly possibly butch, you know, countess who would like, you know, kind of help you out both by like paying for you to like live and be an artist and also help you out in that society really. And I agree with you. It's, if anything, it's become, it, it swung one way, kind of the pendulum, I would say in the sixties, seventies, it, it really, the pendulum like maxed out going in the way of like truly like not even liberal, but like just more open-ended, like, you know, whatever, man, you do mm -hmm. your thing. You know, because in the 50s, it was like, you know, like, um, but then after, you know, going kind of like into the 80s and 90s, and now it's like, I don't know where the fuck we are, because, and so her point, but I know I'm kind of being a little bit um, confusing, but her point is that the trans thing is really the, um, it's like a very insidious way of the power structure and these like very normative rigid symptoms of like no like you have to be you know a very 
you know, boyish boy or manly man, or you have to be like this very feminine woman. And if you're anything in between, then like, you should probably just cut your dick off. You know what I mean? Like, like we just, just but, but regardless, just be one of the categories that we have prefabricated for you. You know, don't be a masculine man who maybe is attracted to other masculine men or don't be, you know, a woman, whatever, you know, you just don't go outside of our things. And so that's really, and I just thought that was really interesting because she said that about the trans thing. And she was like, apparently in, um, in, in Saudi Arabia or one of these countries out there, the new penalty for like this law was recently passed. Like if you, it might be, it was either Iran or Saudi Arabia, something around there. Probably Saudi Arabia, but um, you know, and they, there's a huge underground because of how strict everything is with like, you know, men and women, like there's a, you can imagine like what those people get up to, you know, it's like the Victorian mm -hmm. era, the more repressed you are, like the more like shenanigans people get up to, you know, and there's like a lot of male prostitution and all sorts of stuff. And she was saying that if you get caught as a man doing something with another man, then they just immediately reassign, like they give you the surgery. They just reassigned. They're like, oh, well, you must want to be a woman. Like, you must just not want to have a dick at all. And I feel like that's a really good embodiment of this, like, very arimonic, like, you know, yeah. matrixy, like, mechanized standardization that's like, they don't really care about anything other than ultimately making everyone as the same as possible. And in my mind, where art fits into all of that is, and I, I'll just pull this out because, you know, you gave your, I thought your definition was, was really good. It really made me think. Um, so I wrote, so this is just something that, that came to mind for me is that if you are an artist who just does the same thing all the time, you know, and there's a lot of these, um, then in my mind, that's like, it's like your job in a way. Mm -hmm. Like you can work in a factory and you know, you're mm -hmm. like, you know, you could be stamping a little stamp of like a cat drawing on like a paper, you know, at like some Pier One Imports you know, I don't know, obviously, yeah, I guess yeah, they know yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like you could be, or you could be like, you know, somebody that's actually painting or drawing the cats. But if literally your entire page is just all these fucking cats, in my mind, I don't see like the, the, the drive within the core of your spirit for artistic expression that like you're trying to communicate something or get something across to the collective. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, and this is so, because the thing that, that brought this to mind is what you were saying about the different ways that one can express oneself, because I've always, that's always been my biggest issue, you know, it's like, I, I wouldn't even say I'm a particularly good, you know, drawer or, or whatever, visual artist. I mean, some people really like my stuff, you know, there were eras of it, you know, that were, some better, some worse, you know, then there's the whole thing with all artists where it's like, well, once they stop doing drugs, everything changes and it's just <laughs> not the same. That's a fucking thing. Um, and it's yeah. very hard to recapture that. And you're like, should I just start doing drugs again? No, I'm kidding. But, um, but like, ultimately I struggle because it's like, well, visual, art, especially as time marches on, like visual art might just not be, especially fine art, like by hand might not be the best way to reach people. And so you shift gears. And now I'm like, well, podcasting or like, you know, comedy or like writing or music, like these are all. And so I think for me, when I think of like being an artist, like that person is an artist, like they, there's something in their soul that there's like an inner restlessness and like a fervent, you know, like a, like a soul craving or desire of just like, Oh, like you just see this claustrophobic, like reality just closing in and constricting free expression. And you're just like, 
oh, I don't want to fucking feed into that. I'm going to do my own thing. And that is what drives, in my mind, a true artist, air quotes. But no, that's how I see it. To explore, it's like a thief trying to steal a priceless object. You know, it's like, I'm going to try whatever I have to try to make this shit work, to get through, to, to get, you know, in or out or whatever. You know, that's like, I feel like a good analogy because it's like, ultimately, it's like, I'm, this is what I'm after. This is what I'm after. And if you're not after anything, and honestly, like the world ending is a great thing in the life of an artist, because for me before I was like, well, what am I trying to communicate? Like a kind of, you know, I really like drawing eyes and dragons. And like, you know, I've been told that my stuff looks vaguely Mesoamerican, which is cool. I get like, where does that leave you? But then when the world starts ending, you're like, oh, you know, now, like after, after that ceremony, I went, hey, the Mesoamericans talked about the end of the world too. Yeah. Or like, I'm just like, well, this makes a lot of sense because I really align with the values of these people who like have a way of life and have a, a spirituality. It just, and it makes, it's weird because it's sort of outside of time because my art style has really always depicted that stuff, really, even as a kid, even before I had ever heard of it or knew what it was, That's you know, and then you kind of like, you, you know, you interact with the world and you're like, oh, I've been, I've been drawn to this thing that is like this legitimate. The first time that I heard bluegrass music. Like, that's, that's what, what I was I waiting for. Right. Like, that, yeah. that's, that's it. it. I knew it was in there. I knew somebody was doing something like this, but I didn't hear it. You know, I was like eight or nine years old. I was just like, oh, you can do that? That's what we should be doing. Like, and I'm, I like all different types of music, but I just remember I can, for me, there was that moment. I remember it fairly well, considering I was pretty young. It's just like, oh, yeah, there it is. Right. Yeah, I definitely can identify with that. Although I had that moment much later in life when, when one of my one of my friends ended up playing fiddle in a bluegrass band and I came and I saw them live and I was like, What is going on right now? It's just exactly what you describe. It's that. just like speech. You're like, I can I just live in this moment? Yeah. Like this first moment of experiencing this. But um anyway, so so yeah, I don't know, to to not to put a finer point on it, but the the, the that like I feel like there should be there should be like a desperation and a frustration in a true artist. You know, and even Da Vinci yeah. said he said like, you know, the worst thing that can happen to an artist is he likes his own work. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, you know, and 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 again now, uh, when you repeat that quote now, all you get is like, no, you should love yourself and you should love everything just love and love and light and, and like because people don't They've just lost touch with like, if you want to have skill, to demonstrate skill, if you want to refine your craft, you need to have discernment and judgment and like discipline. And you can't have discipline if you're just okay with everything. Just like you can't, yeah, yeah. You can't have virtue if you just let anybody rape you. Like you, you just, you have to have some boundaries. Otherwise, you know, you just, you, you lose that, that, that sacredness that comes from staying true to yourself. And so that, that's just, I just wanted to like, sort of and say on that, that point, point, whenever, whenever like, oh, you, you know, you, you should just love yourself. You should always love, love yourself. No, 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 you know yourself. Right. Right. And that's very, that I feel like that's a very, um, you know, skillful, kind of hijacking of natural law yeah, right yeah. there, you know, where it's like this, this Pollyanna thing of like, no, it's all good. And like, well, if it's all good, then like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, then why, it just, why are we advertising yeah. shit? If everything's right. good, why do I need to go buy a Pepsi? Yeah. Well, and the, I just, the end result of like, it's all good is like, if you're just sitting around your, you know, coffee table drinking, you know, uh, wine glasses full of baby blood, then like, you know, that's fine because it's all good, you know? So, you know, and I do, there's, there's, there seems to be a movement in that direction. But before, yeah. before we like, um, I don't know, close the book on like the definition of art thing, I wanted to say that, um, you know, you said 
that that the 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 true sort of nature or the true artwork is the experience right and so like that's why a painting by itself isn't art nothing can be art without an observer you know it's like existence itself it's like the universe it's like life yeah. nothing exists without that juxtaposition of the you know the object and the space you know the the thing and the observer you know the the creature and the environment like this the, whatever on this this realm that we're in like there's always that duality if you try to take something in isolation it has no meaning whatsoever i'll, I'll give, you give you my you favorite, favorite example, example. mozart, mozart can write right? the greatest, greatest symphony, symphony and you can hold up the piece of paper and say this is the greatest symphony ever written <laughs> Yeah, it has you know that that that's a meaningless statement, right? Because that's not a symphony. That's a piece of paper. Right. A symphony is the experience of you sitting down and listening to that group of musicians who have practiced exactly what that music you know what those paper pieces of paper are trying to express in the musical language, and getting really good at that, and then sitting down and listening to them and the all the work that they put into it, and experiencing them you know the the end result of all of that all of that work. That's a really good point. And I think And you can see the same symphony, you know, three days later or five years later under a different conductor at a different symphony in a different city. Mm -hmm. And have two completely different, unique and dynamic artistic experiences. Or you could have two terrible, you know, one might be awful. Who knows? In comparison, but Yeah, I think that's you made a good point. You said like learning the language of music. I feel like that's really that's sort of that's at the heart of it for me, because when you think about people like Cardi B or Jackson Pollock, like these are people who, you know, like, I guess it, it's a dicey thing, right? Saying like, oh, you'll have to follow the rules because it's like on the one hand, new movements within art and new things are created through people not following the rules. But the point is, you're still supposed to try to learn the rules first. Before you decide that you want to do something different and break them. And that, by the way, is what art school, I didn't go to art school, FYI. That is what art school was supposed to be, like, and historically was, is like, we're going to give you a strong technical foundation. Same with, you know, music. It's like, we're going to teach you the thing. We're going to teach you the traditional, you know, follow the, the trajectory and, and, and learn the craft and then do whatever the fuck you want after yeah. that. You know, my good friend uh, lived across the hall from me in college, Victor. He was a visual art uh, major. And that was one of the things, one of the first things that he said to me is like, here's what I've learned so far studying art. You have to learn the rules before you can break them. And I've always carried that with me. I think it's yeah, yeah. perfect. And that's exactly, I think, what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, and here's the other thing, too. I always question, you know, and then we talk about... But like, is somebody and maybe Cardi B is not the best example. But I love how we're always thinking of Cardi B. <laughs> She's in my mind. She's the most that was outrageous. My point. Lady yeah. Gaga. Let's say Lady Gaga because oh, I think she's got a little more. I think she actually does know the rules, and is playing a particular game that has little to do with art, if anything to do with art. Probably nothing to do with art. That'd be an interesting conversation. And I the rules the that she's that. following are not the rules of art but they're the rules of whoever is handling her, you yeah. know, whatever her rules are to remain in this death cult that she's right. probably fairly a media, moderate successful as far as the hierarchy of musicians goes. Yeah, I think she's, they've yeah. definitely given her a lot of uh, attention to, to yeah. do these rituals and things that she does. Um, as a witch, she's kind of a big deal in the death cult. I'm just saying. Uh, so somebody like that, I think somebody like that might actually understand the rules. But then you're present. They're presenting something that makes you think this person really doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. But they get it, and what they're doing is they're trying to tell anybody who doesn't critically think about experience and art to just believe that this is what everybody thinks mm. is the thing that we're doing now. This is actually good. This is the best, and, and nobody really thinks that Lady Gaga is the greatest. Everybody, Ooh, just thinks, everybody just thinks that it's in their best interest to say that they like Lady Gaga. Right. Okay. And yeah. therefore they kind of emotionally uh, uh, back that up and we'll get emotional about it. But 
the only reason you, you get emotional about an opinion like that is because you hold some conflicting opinion and your emotion says, well, I can't think about it because they're in, if I think about it, I'll have to resolve the two counter right. the arguments. Yeah. But if I get emotional, I can just push that down and be like, no, Lady Gaga is the best. Right. Which isn't, you know, really an argument or anything, you know, it's, but so, yeah, I think that it's very much about what, what do I, oh, I like this thing. Me, John Q. Publix likes this thing because I think it's what's popular right now. It seems to me like it's popular, not because other people like it. I think they like it and that's why it's popular, but because it's popular. So, and if you can drive the direction of popular music or popular art or whatever it is, then you can start to push this worldview, which is what it's all about. Yeah. On to people, because regardless, Cardi B has a worldview that she communicates through her music. I think it's mostly, I'm not really that familiar with, uh, but I think it's mostly about, you know, hoeing and stuff of that nature. <laughs> Which, okay, but like, once you've done the album about being a hoe, don't go make another album about being a hoe. Try something else. Don't draw another fucking fox. We got it. You did that. Let's right. see another perspective. Let's see. Right. Let's. If that's all that your worldview is, we got it after the first song. We saw you in your song. We get it. You a right. hoe. We get it. Right. That's fine. Go do that. Right. But don't make us think that you talking about that somehow constitutes art unless you're giving us the perspective of what it really means to live that life and look at it honestly, whether that's a good lifestyle to lead right. or not. Right. Right. And it's not a good yeah, life to lead, yeah. but it gets popularized, and therefore that worldview gets eschewed onto mostly young females. I think you are onto some. First of all, I just like to say that when you first when when you first like b said that word, you were like, "It's hoeing." You just <laughs> sounded so white, and I just loved it, and I died. That was peak. That was peak. Two white dudes making a podcast talking about party <laughs> right there. It's about hoeing, ultimately. <laughs> The meaning of life, hoeing. It's about, it's about being one of the hoes. I do declare there is hoeing. Afoot. Well, I, I'll shout out there. Uh, I've been watching an unreasonable amount of Norm MacDonald lately, so mm. that uh, little uh, tap cool. nod to saying something as yeah. white and uptight as possible. Um, well, no, what, what I think you, what, what you, you said something that like I really want to latch on to before my, my drug addled brain forgets about it, um, and that is... You said, does this authentically examine whether this is a good way of moving through life or not? And what I immediately, because I guess I'm obsessed with myself and I'm always preparing my response, which is going to be exciting and impressive. That's what I do. I'm a talker. I was thinking the end of that sentence in my mind was examine whether that's a good way of moving through life. Is that what it does? Or does it simply glorify that thing and i feel like that hits it right on the money because really all of these co-opted movies or I'm mean, movements excuse me in art and in film and in music and all this stuff it's glorifying this really self-destructive way of life and it's glorifying ultimately the death cult Mm -hmm. and, th and that's all the, you know, whether they know it or not, so many of these artists who are following the trend are, whether directly or indirectly, on this payroll, if you will, at mm -hmm. least on a, on a moral, you know, level of like, w again, and I do, I do think it's important to make that distinction of consciously or unconsciously, you know, directly or indirectly, because again, a lot of these people, they're just kind of like... Uh, trying to game the algorithm as best as they can. And they're like, oh, this goth satanic shit is really in. Like, okay, you know, this is not, they're not, you know, that they're not some high priest in the, the, the church of Satan. They're just a dude, you know, making some prints on Instagram. But like, you know, it's like, oh, Baphomet is in. Like, beep, beep, mm -hmm. bop. So, you know, and I think Cardi B and Lady Gaga are really good examples of that, where it's just like, how far can we fall? How degenerate can we get and then still you know how much makeup can we slather on this pig to make it look and, 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 and still, still try, try to, convince to convince people, people that this, this is authentically, authentically an artistic experience, experience when you when interact, interact with whatever media right because people know fundamentally i think that 
this isn't really, I mean, somewhere, this isn't really art. This is <laughs> not, uh, whatever's being put out is not an authentic attempt to put it this way. I think at some level people know they're being manipulated. Whether that's an extremely subconscious level or not. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that, you know, it kind of drives the, you know, the uh, star pedestal cycle, you know, want our celebrities to get so popular that when they fall, we can laugh at them really hard. You know, uh -huh. that's a big thing in this culture. Right. Um, and I think that plays into the cycle because whatever the artist of the day is, we're never really satisfied because we know that whatever this is, isn't really fulfilling us on that artistic level in our soul. Mm -hmm. And so when that person, you know, says something in public, everybody can jump on them. Everybody can. Oh yeah. And now it's their fault. That's the reason why I wasn't feeling fulfilled is you weren't actually an artist. You weren't actually that good. Right. And it's Rather like, no, the artist has nothing to do with your artistic experience. I mean, obviously the artist creates the artifact. Mm-hmm. But whether or not the uh, any individual out of a group of random individuals would have an artistic experience observing that artifact, that's out of the artist's hands. Totally out of the artist's hands. It's like the Madonna or the whore thing, right? Where it's like yeah. one or the other, you know? And yeah. it's like this. And I, I, think, I think that speaks more to just sort of like this lost, disenfranchised kind of schizophrenic society that's in this weird collective trance where it's like, I agree. I agree completely with what you said. I think that, I don't know if people know they're being manipulated. Like, I think no is a loaded term, but I think that they sure. feel sure. yeah, just the abject, bottomless depth of their unfulfillment with life and with this thing, this poor excuse for art that is presented to them you know, just the same way, I mean, just the same way that so many things, you know, now are presented as like, what, you know, whatever, like the, like, I don't know, I heard someone talking about how like, you know, Tibetan Buddhism and like these monasteries and stuff, like, that they were all essentially destroyed. And the ones that are allowed to be seen by the West are like the touristy, like, you know, like, yeah, mm -hmm. like, you know, in, in just, again, to sort of like satisfy people's curiosity. But I think because ultimately the real, the real, um, dare I say, authentic and dare more, I say, kind of sacred, like core essence, like the, the cream, the true cream filling of like what art or whatever or spirituality like is like that people making contact with that is very, very much a threat to this system because i mean and again i think you know that's why i think like these these native ceremonies are so powerful because once you make contact with that you're you can never look at the world in quite the same way again because it's just that dissonance is too potent it's like no this is disrespectful to the real experience that i had with that there at that moment in time and that's that is the experience that is the artistic experience you never look at the world the same way again right yeah 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 the world right. hasn't changed the world doesn't change i mean well change is constant but the world hasn't changed your perspective has changed. The way you view it has changed. You'll never look at it with the same eyes again. And that's ultimately what I would argue that alt is, uh, art is about. Giving somebody the ability to have that experience where they go, wow, I'm never going to look at the world the same way again. Interesting. Okay, so riddle me this, because that just makes me think of... Um, this is actually... Wow, this connects so well with the, the third thing that I had, the final thing that I had in my definition of art. So what I wrote was that, you know, I feel like I've, I've put the word true in air quotes so many times. It's <laughs> losing its potency at this point, but the true, the double. true definition um, the, of, of art is um, if we look at or if we think of a consciousness as the software that runs or renders or filters or reduces reality into a, a form that we can handle then the true artistic experience is like a moment of 
read write access to that software like you're saying because if, if you know if you proof is in the pudding if if you suddenly have the ability through the potency or you know vividness or power of an experience that you have interacting with a, with a, a symphony or stage play or whatever it is you know that you you are so rocked to your core that you are able to make changes to the way you see the world on the most fundamental level then I would say that art is, you know, or again, real art by this definition is by its very nature psychedelic in that it plays with the um, apparatus of perception on the most fundamental level where it's, it just happens, you know, like, like if you're watching a certain play, you get so emotionally invested you know, and then some whatever, like I've been in this position, you know, like I, I went to see a couple shows, you know, with family and stuff. And then by the end of it, you leave and there's just a feeling of like, you know, you're, you're just thinking, you're thinking in a way that you've never thought before. Mm -hmm. and you can't, you mm -hmm. can't help it because you, you've been emotionally taken in and really, you know, really great music does that too, you know, where you just, and I, so I think, those are, that's like my last two, um, you know, my last two horseshoes that I want to throw before we, we fold up the definition of art, uh, you know, just like the, the software thing and the, you know, the, the, the thing with consciousness and like, you know, how I think it's, it's psychedelic because it activates your emotions. And when you activate someone's emotions, you trigger something inside of them. It's like a, a higher level version of like a healing crisis, you know, where their, their consciousness itself is like, Whoa, shit got too real. I might need to shuffle some stuff around, you mm -hmm. know, like the, let, let's, let's take a look at this the same way that if you introduce a certain pathogen into the body, if you're upsetting the balance, this is what I wanted to get to is that if art isn't upsetting some homeostasis emotionally, or in terms of the way you see the world, it's not upsetting some balance. If it's not making the person say, wow, this is outside of my, you know, emotion. This is above my emotional pay grade. Like I never, I did not have space for this before. I had to literally expand my perception in order to even encompass this experience I just had. If it's not doing that, then, you know, what, what is it really doing? You know, other than like creating very many different, slightly different pictures of cats, <laughs> you know, like, It'll be the title for this episode. Many different, many slightly different pictures of cats. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, that's, uh, it all ties together. Um, yeah. I think that your definitions of, and, and, and the expansions of, of, on those ideas, I think really tie in. And, and I think it all is true. I think it all dovetails. I think about it a little bit more, but I, I'm, really kind of pleasantly surprised at how yeah me too a couple of different <laughs> angles that we've, we've come about this and they've all kind of ended up i think we're i think we're on to a working definition which is a uh, kind of the point of i think this episode and we got a whole bunch of other good stuff in here too so yeah it was really really organic and just like uh yeah. cool great synthesis